Hi everyone, it's uh, good to be alive again. I thank God for the opportunity given to us to share in the word of life. And I, I sincerely pray that uh, as you listen to this word, uh, it will meet you in health and in prosperity. By the grace of God, we are going to continue on our series. You remember we started talking about the things that can hinder the effectiveness of the word of God or the promises of God in our life. And uh, the first thing we talked about is how bitterness can be a serious hindrance to the effectiveness of the promises of God in our life. Today, we're going to be looking at how a lack of faith can hinder the effectiveness of the promises of God in our life. And before we do this, we're going to try and understand what faith is in the first place um, and how a lack of it can hinder the effectiveness of the promises of God. According to the book of Hebrew, it describes faith as a substance of what we hope for, the evidence of things unseen. Uh, uh, and uh, the King James is actually cool in this area. In, in chapter 11, it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. As I ponder on this definition, one thing that suddenly came to my mind is that a person hoping for something is responsible for creating the substance of what they expect. And I see the reason why it is so important. I realize that as a person, if I am hoping for something from God and I don't only need to know what I need, but I also have to have an imagination of what I need. Let me explain what this is. I, I, if I need to be healed, and I don't know what it means to be healed, obviously, I'm not going to ask God to heal me. If I'm going to ask God for favor, I have to, under, I have to know what the favor I am looking for from God is. Knowing that aspect of it, of it by itself is that substance. That image becomes the evidence of what I am hoping for. If a person who is blind goes to the Lord and says, Lord, help me, and what they really want is to receive a sight, and they say, well, I don't know, just, just help me. Well, I don't know what I'm going to help you for because I do not know what you need. So the idea here is that without a substance for what I am hoping for, I will not get what I am hoping for as my expectation. Why? It's so simple. Because no substance is equal to nothing. If there's no substance, if there's no image of what you want, then it does not exist. And therefore, that individual cannot expect anything. So if you don't understand what the promises of God are, then you don't even have an imagination of what they are. You will not get anything. Like God, I realize that by our design, we were given a, a God's nature in our design, that is his likeness and his image. And just like he is the creator of all things by faith. We are also called to display this character of creativity by faith because we carry his image and likeness. By the nature, by nature, God created everything by speaking to them into existence as if they were by the word of faith. This is how the apostle puts it. In Romans chapter 8, verse 17, he directly says, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, 
who gives life to the dead and calls into existence, hear this, the things that do not exist. I mean, you will say the things well that he probably knew about, but the scripture is saying here, God called into existence the things that do not exist. Basically, God created an imagination. He knew exactly what he wanted and he called it into existence. This verse, in this verse, we can see that God displayed the power of his faith into speaking things into existence that did not exist. Yet because he called these things by name, this is where you and I have to really level with each other. So it is okay, God is God. He called the things that do not exist into existence, but he still had to follow a certain principle. And that principle is simply, is very simple. He called that thing by name. He had a substance for what he wanted to call into existence. And they existed. He had the substance of his expectation in his mind. When he said, let there be light, God knew what light looked like in his mind. As a people, as a people, we are called to behave like him. Hear this. Because we carry his image and likeness, God expects us to display this part of our being by acting in faith. And that is why the book of Hebrews says, without faith, it is impossible. In other words, it is absolutely impossible to please God. In Hebrews 11, 6, in reality, anyone without faith can never be a friend of God. Anyone who is not a friend of God cannot lay claim to the promises of God, not being able to bring those things alive for their use. It is simple. If you don't have faith, your faith is saying God does not exist. And if God does not exist, then there will be no substance or promise from God that you can lay claim to. Simply, these promises, this is the reason, can only be unlocked by the faith of God. Here in Romans 4, chapter 6, and this is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. The reality here is that the promises of God rest upon faith. And since we are all under grace, Therefore, a lack of faith as concerning the promises of God will totally hinder the manifestation of the promises of God. They tie together. One cannot say, you know, Lord, I, I, I am a Christian, but I don't really have faith. You cannot claim that you are a Christian and not have faith. You became a Christian because by faith you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you believed in the sacrifices that he paid for your sin. You believe that he forgave your sin. You believe that he pulled you from darkness into light. It's all by faith. It is by faith that this grace came upon you. You know, if I'm allowed to use this word, a lack of faith is like a kryptonite to the substance of our expectation and the promises of God being active in our life. The moment Peter gave up on the substance of his faith, he began to sink. I would like you to listen to this. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 25 to verse 31. Shortly before then, Jesus went out to them, that is the apostles, 
walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied. Now, from this point on, Peter began to form a substance of faith. And you will see as we read on, that right in Peter's mind, he had formed a substance of faith. And that substance is, I would love to walk on the water as Jesus walked. In his mind, he saw himself walking on the water. Now, hear this. Lord, if it is you, verse 28, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, in other words, Peter's ability to keep the substance of his faith in his mind began to shift from the author and the finisher of his faith, Jesus Christ, to the water. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Now, I want you to see the response. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? So we can all see what I'm trying to say here, that a lack of faith is a neutralizer of the activation or active expression of the promises of God in our lives. So once you doubt, you are creating a set of events that will prevent the activity of the faith or of your faith and the expectation you have concerning the promises of God. It will be neutralized. It's like taking an eraser and cleaning something that you have written with your pencil on the paper. It will not exist again. I'd like you to understand this from the beginning that all blessings come from God. A lack of faith is actually saying that God does not exist. The second part of Romans, uh, 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 Hebrews uh, 6, 11, that we read says, anyone who must come to God must believe first that God exists. In other words, you have to have a substance of the fact that God exists in your mind. And that is the first assignment of faith, to believe that God exists. Our faith must believe that not only does he exist, that he is, that means God is available. He is constantly around. And if your faith does not see God that way, in other words, any deviation from this means we cannot claim the promises that come from an inexistent God. Literally, a faithless person shoots themselves in the foot when it comes to apprehending the blessings that come from God. Why? Because in our, in our belief that he is we will also believe that he rewards those who have faith in him because nothing is impossible with God. All blessings flow from a God that is alive, that is faithful, that does not change, that is. And if a person in their mind lacks faith as concerning the existence of God and his being, then they also will automatically lack the ability to apprehend any blessing that comes from this God who is alive. 
because for them, God does not exist. And this is why it is so important. And those who want God to prove himself to them before they believe, they will never get any proof. Because for them, he does not exist. The very first element of a test to see whether God exists, they have already thrown that into the winds. They have already told themselves that there can be no God, there is no substance here, he is not. And so merely asking God to prove themselves makes no sense because they have already disqualified themselves. I'd like you to hear this. God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That is the second part of that verse we read in the book of Hebrews. In our faith, our diligence in coming after God and his promises will never go unrewarded because our diligence is saying he is. And without investing our diligence in going after God, it means we don't believe he is worth our effort in breaking through the physical realm into the unseen to bring about the substance of our faith because we believe that he is. And this is why James says this in the book of James chapter one. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Apart from having faith as a means to apprehending the promises of God <clears throat> and to make sure that they are effective in our lives, we must watch out that the devil does not steal our faith. So there is a problem of a lack of faith making it impossible for us to enjoy or discover or activate the promises of God in our lives. Along with that is also the danger that our faith can be stolen. In Luke chapter 8, verse 12, this is what the Lord says, that the, the word of God is like the words that fell on the path. Let me read it. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. So you see, our salvation is directly tied to our belief in the word of God. The apostle Paul says that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The word is what brings faith alive, especially the word of God. Once the devil is allowed to steal the word from our heart, we cannot have faith since the word is what creates the substance of the promises of God. In Mark chapter 9, verses 23 to 25, Jesus said to him, to the Father who came for help, if you can believe, all things are possible to those who believe. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came, in, came running down, he rebuked the unclean spirit saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter no more. We must be like this father who ran to Jesus for help for his child, although his faith was not enough, yet he knew enough to ask the Lord to help his unbelief. In apprehending the promises of God to our good in, and, and in using the promises of God as a tool to take us to the plan and the purposes of God in this, on this side of eternity, we must be willing 
to ask the Lord to help any form of unbelief in our life. And what is important or ironic in all of this is that we do not need mountains of faith to apprehend the promises of God. We can begin somewhere with a faith as small as the seed of a mustard plant. The important thing is that we must have faith. Dear friend, this, this morning, I would like to let you know, as Jesus said to his disciples, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. In other words, you could have a tiny grain of faith, and you can do great things with it. But more than anything, dear friends, as I bring to this teaching to an end, what I would like you to work with is this, that you do not need a mountain of faith, and in this time, as we are all on the side and groaning and walking towards the day that the people that we really are will be revealed, we must walk in faith because our faith is saying God is. And our faith is saying he is a rewarder. And all that we need, we can begin from a tiny amount of faith, as small as the seed of a mustard plant. And with this, we can apprehend the promises of God. Friend, I pray for you this week that uh, it will be a week of blessing. It will be a week where you will truly enjoy more of the promises of God, that your faith will drive you further into God's blessing and his plans for you. May his grace shine upon you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm praying that uh, if Jesus does not show up this week, that you will continue to grow in him. But if he does, I pray that you will not be missing in the number of the people that will be meeting with Jesus. At the same time, I would like to talk to you if you have not made a choice to give your life to Jesus. You need faith. You need to believe in the word of God that is able to save. All you need to say is, Dear Lord Jesus, I accept your sacrifice. Please come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. If you say such prayers from your heart, you will definitely receive the gift of salvation. May the Lord richly bless you. Amen.